afternoon. I am delighted to be here today to have the opportunity to talk to you about how I believe we can use design to change the world. And I don't know what you think of when you think of design, but I think even based on the last conversation, we often think of this. This object has become a piece of fascination for us because it has transformed the way we create and we collaborate and we communicate. And some of us, and you have to confess, sleep with this object. <laughs> While others of us, if we've lost it, actually feel as though we've lost a part of ourselves. Yes? <laughs> But when I dig a little deeper and I look at the statistics of who's actually owning one of these objects, and the highest percentage on this map is represented by the red color, and the lowest percentage moves down the scale from orange all the way down to green, we can see that not everyone is existing with an iPhone, and not everyone is being changed by this technology. In fact, I would propose that we live in a world today that is begging for more than the design of objects to solve its significant problems. We can look at issues of homelessness, of transportation, food security, and even our own economy are things we're beginning to question if we haven't been already. And so today, we are at TED, and we all love ideas worth spreading. But I propose that if we're going to make these ideas hold any value for our future, we need to be about action. And when I think about someone who's really inspired me and taken an idea and turned it into action, I think about a man by the name of Dr. John Snow. Dr. Snow was a physician in the 1800s, and he was really curious about how cholera was spread. The common notion of the day is that it was an airborne illness and that you had to inhale it. But Dr. Snow wasn't convinced of this. He actually believed you had to ingest it through your mouth. And in 1854, when cholera broke out in London, Dr. Snow wanted to see if he could prove his theory. And he did this not by staying in his doctor's office, but by going outside to talk to people. And what he did in talking to people was begin to map all of the incidences of cholera in a particular region of London. And what this mapping did for him was show him where all of these people were getting sick. And it revealed a correlation that everyone who lived in close proximity to and got their water from the Broad Street water pump were the ones who were getting sick and potentially dying. What Dr. Snow did after this is not just wait to see, oh, that's nice, I've got this information. He actually took it to the city officials and showed this visual to them and made a compelling argument, so much so that they removed the handle from the water pump and actually saw cholera dissipate. Now, I love Dr. Snow's work so much because I'm a designer. And I always love the power of design to take something that is complex and use visuals to make it compelling. And in this case, it changed the world. But I also love Dr. Snow because I believe he gives a lesson to all of us about what it means to take an idea and turn it into action. And I would propose he didn't do it haphazardly. I would propose to you today that he actually used a design process. Now, many of us can talk about de design process in different kinds of ways. And if you're designers out in the audience, you may have your own particular method. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk about it through these four lenses. I believe for every design project, there is a point of discovery, a time to understand what people really need. From there, we move to actually defining the problem we're, act we're trying, looking to solve. Then we move on to developing opportunities. Those can be many. We don't try to refine it too quickly until we've explored a lot of options. And from there, we move to a point of delivery. And if we skip these steps, we run into the risk of actually doing a failed project. And so, like I said, I think the idea to action strategy needs a process for us to go through. Otherwise, we just have these random ideas going nowhere, and even potentially random actions making no difference in the world. I would propose that as soon as Dr. Snow found out that there was cholera and there was a problem, he went to define an objective, a problem he wanted to solve, and in the end delivered something that actually changed the world. And the reason I'm so convinced of this is because I've been complicit in a design project 
that led to failure. And this failure came because we jumped all the way to the very end of the process. And I'd like to tell you about that experience. A few years ago, I was invited to be a participant in a sustainable development project in Rwanda. I was a designer, and my task was to develop a website for a group of women who were living in a rural community. They were taking an environmental problem and turning it into an economic opportunity. The problem is this particular plant known as the water hyacinth. It's a plant that grows over the lakes and rivers of the region in East Africa. It affects many countries, in fact. But these women are actually taking the plant and extracting it. Because if they didn't, the amount of growth over the lakes and rivers actually eradicates them and kills off life forms and kills off water sources for these women and for these communities. They're taking this particular plant and transforming it into a weaving fiber. And from there, they're turning the weaving fiber into handicrafts they can actually sell. And while this is lovely and I was invited to participate, the problem was I was asked to build a website. And the website was for a community of people who had no computers, no internet, and no electricity. Excellent. As a designer, that's a huge failure. That feels like you've, you've, you're defeated, you're actually so discouraged, because the thing you've made is actually not really going to make a difference. And the Google Analytics prove it. No one really goes to the site. So I wanted to go back, before I left on this project, to the beginning of the design process. And I did this by spending time with the women and talking to them more about the weaving business in Rwanda. And I learned that it's quite competitive. And in fact, these women don't necessarily have a way to distinguish themselves from the rest of the weaving cooperatives in the country. And they know that some women get their work sent off to New York and put into Macy's department store, and they would love that opportunity because they know it gives them more income. And so rather than jumping ahead to figuring out already what I wanted to deliver, I redefined the question. And I asked, how might we create a brand mark to help distinguish this cooperative and how might we spread this brand story when electricity and computers are not available? Changing the question changed what we might move forward on. And what's typical for a designer is to take that question and go work by herself or himself and get focused on how they'll solve it. But instead, I chose to switch the story, and I chose to invite the women to be the creators of their own logo. We spent some time together, and they drew various pictures um, of all the ideas that they possibly could have about what was possible for their logo mark. Things like baskets, which are the most obvious thing, emerged. My favorite, I think, was that they actually drew furniture, even though they'd never made a furniture piece in their whole time together. But I like to think of it as this future forward thinking, quite entrepreneurial. In the end, we decided that the water hyacinth was the actual icon that made the most sense because it was the fiber that made this particular group very different. And so I turned it into a logo mark for them. But rather than just putting it on the website, I actually turned it into a rubber stamp because that didn't require computers or electricity to allow them to spread their brand story. Now, what this whole experience has taught me is that we have a very interesting focus in our world. We currently live and are compelled by the expert. And we think that the expert knows the answer. In fact, many development projects are developed, designed, created, and implemented by experts sending them out to the people who need the solution. And we can talk of many failures in this particular sector. I would propose that in our world, we need to shift this. We need to look at many of us as the expert. You are the expert of your own experience. And the reason you don't take action on things is sometimes because you don't even feel you have a place at the table. So in thinking about this and thinking about the projects in development, I went back to think about my own. And I realized that because the development project had been assigned to me rather than developed with this community and me being a part of that conversation, we were limited in the outcomes. I switched it to see what it would look like if women had a toolkit to develop their own development project. In the toolkit were pictures, because I need to clarify, we didn't speak the same language. We couldn't communicate using our typical verbal messaging. In the toolkit were cameras and notepads and pencils and pictures, and I was not present as the expert. 
I gave it to a Rwandan colleague and asked him to ask the women to complete the tasks. These various tasks were asking them to take pictures of things that they loved about their community, to draw pictures of things they wanted to change in their community. And in the end, we have a lot of visual content that helps us to reimagine what another development project might be beyond a piece of technology. These are some of the images that the women created. I can see lots of potential for projects that help with transportation and food and other necessary items in a community's survival and thriving opportunity. These are some of the images that they took. And what's fascinating to me about this particular part of the project was that they took pictures when given an average daily wage, which is about a dollar US, of things that they bought with that dollar US. And for the record, the majority of the photographs that came back were pictures of food. So it begs the question of thinking about a larger system in our world rather than a one-off design project. Now, we don't all live in Rwanda, and this may seem like it's a far-off story and something that was nice for that particular scenario. But I believe it's a compelling argument for how we live today and how we transform our world. I'm currently working with a group of students, none of whom are designers, who want to make a difference in our city around cycling. They know that not everyone wants to cycle. And they know that there are some inhibitors as to why people may or may not choose to become part of a cycle-friendly city. And rather just assume that there's nothing that we can do and just hope that people will want to buy a bike next year, they're actually embedding themselves in the problem. They call themselves Team Break the Cycle, and they have looked at a discovery process that is very interesting. What they uncovered in their research was that people didn't buy bikes and didn't get into biking because they were deeply afraid of bike theft. So they've interviewed bike thieves, and they have interviewed the police, and they have talked to our city and the part of our city that's really interested in cycling. And they are actually proposing a social enterprise that would help create jobs and reduce bike theft. Unfortunately, it's top secret information. I won't know till next week what comes of it. But I'm excited because they're actually moving it to the place where it could be implemented. Dr. John Snow is who I started telling you a story about today. And I propose that he use the design process to make a change in the world. He saw that there was cholera. He wanted to figure out how it was spread. When it came into being, he wanted to figure out how to stop it. He mapped that problem and actually changed the system by getting it into the hands of people who could do something about it. And I believe if Dr. Jon Snow had not acted on that day and on those various days to collect all of that data, we might still have cholera. And I believe today that if we don't stop just talking about ideas and not getting us to the place where we will actually put them into action, we run the risk of losing the very things that are important to us and we have evidence of it every time we turn on the news. So you are people who have the ability to engage a process. You can discover people's needs, you can move it through to a delivery that will make sense, and you can share the table with others to make a difference in our world. Thank you very much.